Hi, my name is Wes, and welcome to this event at the University Bookstore. Tonight's book is located right behind you and is available for an author signing at the end. The book's title is You Know You Bought This. Just a few things to address before we get started. We'll be keeping the register downstairs open past 7, which is our usual time for closing. So if you're interested in buying a book, you can go to the floor below us at any time during or after the event. You know you want this brilliantly explores the ways in which women are horrifying as much as it captures the horrors that are done to them. Spanning a range of genres and topics, from the mundane to uh, yes. the murderous to the supernatural, these are stories about sex and punishment, guilt and anger, the pleasure and terror of inflicting and experiencing pain. These stories fascinate and repel revolt and arouse, scare and delight in equal measure. Kristen Rupanian graduated from Bernard College and holds a PhD in English from Harvard, as well as an MFA from the Helen Zell Writers Program at the University of Michigan. She is the author of the short story Cat Person, which was published in The New Yorker and selected for the Best American Non-Required Reading 2018, and she is currently working on a novel. Megan Jeffrey is a storyteller who has dedicated her life to her philosophy connecting more than just the dots. She is a communications professional with extensive experience in digital technologies and audience engagement. She earned her BA in journalism from California Polytechnic State University and then went on to set to get a master's from the UW Communications Leadership Program. So with that, please join me in welcoming our guests. <laughs> Thanks very much, everybody. <laughs> Thanks for coming out. Um, yeah, uh, I think we're going to have fun. I am going to read just a small bit from the last story in the collection. It's a story called Biter. Um, it's pretty self-contained since the beginning. I'll probably read for about 10 minutes, um, and then we'll do a Q&A. Yep. Biter. Can you hear me okay? Ellie was a biter. She bit other kids in preschool, bit her cousins, bit her mom. By the time she was four years old, she was going to a special doctor twice a week to work on biting. At the doctor's, Ellie made two dolls bite each other, and then the dolls talked about how biting and being bitten made them feel. Ouch, one said. Sorry, said the other. I feel sad about that, said the one. I feel happy, said the other, but sorry again. She brainstormed lists of things she could do instead of biting, like raise her hand and ask for help, or take a deep breath and count to 10. At the doctor's suggestion, Ellie's parents put a, better, put a chart on Ellie's bedroom door, and Ellie's mom put a gold star on it for every day that Ellie didn't bite. But Ellie loved biting, even more than she loved gold stars, and she kept on biting, joyfully and fiercely, until one day after preschool, pretty Katie Davis pointed at Ellie and whispered loudly to her dad, that one's Ellie, no one likes her, she bites people. And Ellie felt so sick with shame, she didn't bite anyone again for more than 20 years. As an adult, though her active biting days were long behind her, Ellie still indulged in daydreams in which she stalked her coworkers around the office, biting them. For example, she imagined sneaking into the copy room where Thomas Whittacombe was collating reports, so engrossed in his task that he didn't notice Ellie creeping up behind him on all fours. Ellie, what on earth, Thomas Whittacombe would cry in the final seconds before Ellie sunk her teeth into his plump and hairy calf. For while the world had succeeded in shaming Ellie out of biting, it couldn't make her forget the joy of tiptoeing up behind Robbie Ketrick while he was standing at the craft table, smugly stacking blocks. Everything is normal, quiet, boring. Now here comes Ellie, chomp. Now Robbie Ketrick is screaming like a baby and everybody is scrambling and yelling and Ellie is no longer just a little girl, but a wild creature pacing the halls of the preschool sowing chaos and destruction in her wake. 
The difference between children and adults is that adults understand the consequences of their actions. And Ellie, as an adult, understood that if she wanted to pay her rent and keep her health insurance, she could not run around fighting people at work. Therefore, for a long time, Ellie did not seriously consider fighting her coworkers. Not until the office manager died of a heart attack at lunch in front of everyone, and the temp agency sent Corey Allen to replace him. Corey Allen. Later, Ellie's coworkers would ask each other, what on earth had the people at the temp agency been thinking sending him? Green-eyed, blonde-haired, pink-cheeked Corey Allen did not belong in an office environment. Corey Allen, like a fawn or a satyr, belonged in a sunlit field surrounded by happy, naked nymphs making love and drinking wine. As Michelle in accounting put it, Corey Allen gave off the distinct impression that he might, at any second, decide to quit being an office manager and run off to live in a tree. Ellie, who was something of an outcast at work, often walked in on hushed conversations about Corey Allen that presumably centered around how much the other women in the office wanted to sleep with him. Corey Allen was beautiful and fed. Ellie didn't want to have sex with Corey Allen. Ellie wanted to bite him hard. She discovered this while watching Corey Allen place glazed donuts on a platter before the Monday morning meeting. When he'd finished arranging the donuts, he turned around and, noticing her staring at him, winked. Why, Ellie, you look hungry, he said with a leer. Ellie had not been checking out Corey Allen the way he seemed to be implying. She hadn't even been thinking about the donuts. But suddenly, she found herself imagining what it would be like to lock her jaws onto the soft part of Corey Allen's neck. Corey Allen would yelp and sink to his knees, that entitled look wiped right off his face. He'd slap weakly at her and cry, Oh no, Ellie, stop, please, what is going on? But Ellie wouldn't answer, because her mouth would be too full of Corey Allen's sweet and gamey flesh. Not that it had to be his neck. She wasn't picky about location. She could bite Corey Allen on his hand, or his face, or his elbow, or his ass. Each would have a different taste, a different mouthfeel, a different proportion of bone to fat to skin. Each would be, in its own way, delectable. Maybe I will bite Corey Allen, Ellie thought after the meeting. Ellie worked in communications, which meant that she spent 90% of her time crafting emails that no one ever read. <laughs> she had a savings account and life insurance, but no lover, no ambition, no close friends. Her entire existence, she sometimes felt, was premised on the idea that pursuing pleasure was less important than avoiding pain. Perhaps the problem with adulthood was that you weighed the consequences of your actions too carefully in a way that left you with the life you despised. What if Ellie did bite Corey Allen? What if she did? What then? That night, Ellie changed into her nicest pajamas, lit a candle, and poured herself a glass of Cabernet. Then she uncapped a pen, opened her favorite notebook, and turned to a fresh page. Reasons not to bite Corey Allen. <laughs> One, it is wrong. Two, it could get in trouble. She nibbled on the tip of her pen that added two subsidiary points. Reasons not to bite Corey Allen. One, it is wrong. Two, I could get in trouble. A, I could get fired. B, I could get arrested and or fined. Ellie thought, if it meant that I could bite Corey, I would not mind getting fired. For the past year and a half, she'd spent most of her lunch hour, most days, on her phone, swiping through job postings on Monster.com. She was ready for a new position and felt perfectly well qualified for one. However, finding a new job after quitting your old one was not the same as finding a new job after you'd been fired for your old one for biting. Would it be impossible to get a new job in those circumstances, or merely very difficult? It was hard to know. Ellie sipped her wine and turned her attention to B, I could get arrested and or fined. Well, that was certainly a possibility. But the truth was that if a woman bit a man in an office environment, there would be a strong assumption that the man had done something to deserve it. If, for example, she went up to Corey and bit him in full view of everyone at Monday morning meeting, and then later, when they asked her why she'd done it, she answered sexual gratification, then yes, she'd probably be arrested. 
But if instead she bit Corey in private, say in the copy room, and when they asked her why she'd done it, she said, he tried to touch me inappropriately, or even so as not to mar his reputation, he came up behind me and scared me, I bit him instinctively, I'm so sorry, then people would probably give her the benefit of the doubt. When you got right down to it, as a young white woman without a criminal record, Ellie probably had at least one get out of jail free card. As long as she spun some semi-reasonable story, she would be believed. In fact, Ellie thought, as she stretched out her legs and refilled her glass of wine, there was another possibility for how this could all play out. What if she went up to Corey in private and bit him, and the experience was so bizarre that he didn't tell anyone about it because he had trouble believing it himself? Imagine, it's late in the afternoon, past five, dark already, the office is empty. Everyone but Corey and Ellie has gone home. Corey is loading paper into the Xerox machine when Ellie enters the room. She stands beside him, inappropriately close. He thinks he knows what is coming. He stiffens, preparing to politely reject her, not because he has standards for workplace propriety, but because he's already hooking up with Rachel from HR. Ellie, he begins apologetically as she grabs his forearm and lifts it to her mouth. Corey's lovely face contorts, first in shock, then pain. Stop it, Ellie, he cries out, but no one hears him. The tendons of his arm roll and snap beneath Ellie's jaws. Finally, Corey gathers his wits enough to shove Ellie away. She stumbles backwards, leans against the stacks of coffee paper, and slides to the ground. Corey stares at her in horror, clutching his bleeding arm. He's waiting for her explanation, but she gives him none. Instead, she stands up calmly, straightens her skirt, and wipes the blood from her mouth before she leaves the room. What does Corey do? Of course, he could run straight to HR and say, Ellie bit me, but after all, it was an office, not a preschool. Everything about the conversation would be ridiculous. Ellie, did you bite Corey? They would ask, and Ellie would raise her eyebrows and say, uh, no, what a weird question. <laughs> if the HR people tried to push and said, Ellie, these are serious allegations, all Ellie would have to say was, yeah, seriously insane. Of course I did not bite the office manager, and I don't know why he's saying that I did. Really, the odds were high that Corey wouldn't say anything at all. He would stay in the copy room for a while, contemplating the situation, and then, the next day, he'd decide that the easiest thing to do would be to pretend it hadn't happened. He'd show up to work in a long sleeve shirt to cover the ugly bruise on his arm, the little half moon where she'd marked him with her teeth. And then, part of Corey Allen's brain would be reserved for keeping track of where exactly Ellie was. She'd catch him looking at her in meetings, and when they were at office parties together, he'd continually be moving, trying to keep as far as possible away from her. In a way, it'd be like they were always dancing, even if he never spoke to her again. Months later, when no one was watching, she'd grin and snap her jaws at him, and he'd turn ghost pale and hurry from the room. He would remember her for the rest of his life. They'd be joined by the glistening strands of his fear. Later that night, the sweat drying on her body, her legs tangled in the sheets, Ellie forced herself to go back out to the living room and get her notebook. Fantasies were fantasies, but it was important to keep at least one foot in the realm of the real. She got back in bed and opened the notebook and rewrote her list. Reasons not to bite Corey Allen. One, it is wrong. Two, it is wrong. Three, it is wrong. Four, it is wrong. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. <laughs> All right. Whoops. Hello. Yes. Okay. Question and answer time. Mm -hmm. So this is a collection of short stories. And before we get into talking about your most well-known short story, where I wanted to start was why choose to write short stories? What do they afford you as an author that another format couldn't? Um, a bunch of different things. Um, in practice, there are often things that I write when I need to step away from something else. Um, they tend to come on kind of like, I say like a fever dream. <laughs> like I'll just have an idea and I'll want to be able to get it down. And this short story, one thing that's really wonderful about them um, as a writer is that they can be kind of contained in a single moment of, of writing and a moment of experience. Um, so 
I usually when I write a short story, I write it from beginning to end. I have a sense of where it's going as I'm going. Um, and I think that they can do a lot of different things. They can probably do as many different things as a novel could or any other form. But I think at best, they are a single kind of immersive experience. You read them all at once and you read them in a kind of propulsive burst where then if it's like worked on you, you're interested in going back and seeing how it functioned and like picking apart and thinking about it. But the, the first way through is like a single unified experience. Mm -hmm. And so you exploded into pop culture with the story. I know you're putting it, sure. Cat person. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, to me, it was a viral explosion. As you and I talked about, yeah. it was rare that I would have people recommending a short story to me like they would the hottest new article from Wired or something yeah. like that. And so with Cat Person, why do you think it resonated with so many people and went on to have such a life of its own? I mean, that's a great question, to which I don't know the answer. <laughs> I don't think anyone does. Um, I think, and the, I guess the thing to say too, that I always try and point out when I try and explain everything that happened is that I saw it from like a very unique perspective and that I missed it the first time around. Mm -hmm. Like when the story was going viral pretty quickly, I realized there was too much happening for me to keep track of that I couldn't engage with it because it was all happening so fast. And so um, I turned my computer off and everything this past year has been a process for me of going back and trying to like think through what happened and why. Mm -hmm. And I think, so what I understand from like other people um, is I think there are a few different things going on. I think part of it was the timing. Um, I think Cat Person, as you know, like is a story that is about many things, but then one specifically about like gray areas of consent, which I think at the moment that um, it appeared, there was a real hunger for people to ha have those conversations and tell those stories. And I think it offered like a way for people to talk about some really difficult and sensitive things, but underneath the like the umbrella of, of fiction with like a little bit more freedom than they might have felt if they were reading a first person essay. I think rightly, you know, you can talk about fiction um, more broadly um, and then you can then you might an essay. So I think it was it was largely that. I think the story also has a kind of like has a little bit of a um, like <laughs> blue dress, white dress, if you remember that phenomenon, like oh, characteristic yes. to it that I think um, one, so I think the first wave of the story, people were talking about it, it was mostly women, they were mostly talking among themselves, they were using it as a way to talk through a bunch of kind of complicated experiences that they didn't, hadn't maybe had a, had a way to talk about before. But then I think as it moved into the second wave of like internet popularity or virality, the fact that it was something that you could fight about, mm -hmm. that it seemed like people were ready to sort of stake out claims, um, kind of fired what I think of as like the, the most sort of intense level of internet conversation mm -hmm. where it fe felt like for a moment you had to have an opinion, like Robert, Margo, good, <laughs> that, that level of like split um, conversation, I think happened essentially, not by accident, but like was a function of a story that could be interpreted really mm -hmm. differently by different people. And as a modern author who is exposed on all these different social media platforms where people can immediately post their opinion and their thoughts, and there were many, many thought pieces yeah. written about Cat Person, how do you deal with the discord and yeah. the discourse? <laughs> I mean, I try not to. Mm -hmm. um, pretty purposefully, it seemed with Cat Person in particular, it seemed like this the conversation was moving so fast and I couldn't keep up and I knew that if I tried to jump into it, I would almost certainly just like lose my bearings and it didn't need me. I think the conversation went better because I wasn't a part of it, trying to tell people how to interpret the story. Mm -hmm. um, I think as just a human trying to survive in the world, I have to let go both of my own story and of kind of like my name and the idea of me and the writer that wrote this story. I just, like there was just a point, has been a point where I'm just like, this isn't, like this isn't about me. Like I'm proud I created this story. I'm happy that I put it in the world, but I can't own, take responsibility for like the multitude of ways that people are, are reading it because if I, if I try to, then I'll want to control it or mm -hmm. um, direct it and I know that I can't. And so for me, it's been a really 
long, and I feel like this year taught me in a way that I never knew how much I value my own privacy and how much the gap between like your public facing self and your like private self like really matters and like preserving that and kind of defending it matters a lot especially like when you want to go back to writing and you have if you're going to do that in a legitimate way you have to like tune out if not tune down if not out all the voices who have opinions about how you write and what they want you to write about and what your work should mean so mm -hmm. yeah yeah I think it's really interesting that you bring up the difference between a public self and a private self because so many of the stories in this collection deal with that yeah and so what is it do you think um, causes us to be very honest with ourselves internally to the point where we're almost screaming at ourselves like some of uh -huh. your characters do in their stories versus how carefully we craft our external personas yeah. and how does that resonate with you and also throughout your writing and why do you think that that's important to discuss? Yeah, I mean, that's something I think about a lot. Um, if it, I did think it is ironic to me that like a large part of what Cat Person is about, I think, is about how we imagine ourselves into the minds of other people and that so much of getting to know someone is telling our telling ourselves stories about them, who they are, what they want, how they see us, and then either having those stories confirmed or like proven and correct or replaced with other ones. And so like, yeah, my experience as a writer when Cat Person appeared was that a lot of people thought a lot of things about who I was and why I'd written the story that I'd written and what I wanted people to take away from it and what my goals would have been. And those were invented, you know, like some of them landed closer to home than others, but like it really was this like illustration or it felt like to me of like how much people, like especially the less people have of you, the more they're willing to fill in the blanks with things that have more to do with them than with mm -hmm. you. And I, I think that's not, I, like, I think to a certain degree that's natural. Like it's easy to criticize and like certainly I've had moments where I've been frustrated by it, but like it, it has brought home to me how much of the reading experience is, you do always imagine an author on the other side of the page, you know, like that we tell ourselves in English classes that we're not supposed to, right? That the author is dead and that the mm -hmm. text is pure, but I don't think that's true. I think there's always an imagined author. The question is whether you're like cognizant enough that you did that imagining, right? Mm -hmm. Not to try not to do it, but just to recognize it, that it's your own creation. Um, and yeah, and I think that, I guess, yeah, I mean, I, I it's been strange to be on the other side of it mm -hmm. so quickly. I think that anybody who writes anything learns to let go of their work and to let go of like to know to understand that people will like imagine things about them and have like I heard the phrase parasocial relationship mm -hmm. the other day, which I never heard, which means maybe everyone knows, but like when you have sort of essentially an imagined or one-sided relationship with like a celebrity or someone mm -hmm. who like talks to you on Twitter. Um, and so, yeah, it's been, it's been very sudden for me, but I don't think it's like unusual fundamentally or like that there's anything wrong with it. I'm just wrapping my mind around it. <laughs> yeah, and I think it's interesting that you bring up the idea of the death of the author in a parasocial relationship because in reality, we often feel more close to artists and, and, and people we admire than ever before where we're referring to them by first names like they're actually our friends because we have access to some of their thoughts on, on Twitter. And the dark side of that is the audience has started to demand more uh -huh. of creators. And what struck me about some of the characters in your writing is also how they have these desires and these things that they demand of other people. Mm -hmm. and they both hunger for them so much, but they're also deeply ashamed. Yeah. And so have you encountered anything of people starting to demand more personally of you um, now that you've, you're out in the world <laughs> with yeah. these stories? Yeah, for sure. Um, I wouldn't have put it that way, but I think, mm -hmm. or I hadn't <laughs> thought about it that way, but it's definitely true. Um, I think, like, for example, I wrote a bunch of nonfiction when the book was coming out, which I guess is just a normal thing to do. Um, I sort of wrote personal essays, and truly every single personal essay I got back was like, can you make this more personal? <laughs> and I was like, okay. And then, like, of course, that's what they're for. But just, like, my own willingness to be, like, very explicit and also, like, personal in fiction, like, does not translate for me and wanting to write really detailed in a really detailed way about my personal life mm -hmm. or to talk about it and um and that has been 
like surprising to me or like I'd come up against it. It's also been true, like one of the things, going back to the other question that happened was when I wrote the story that a lot of, or when Cat Person came out, a lot of people um, like sort of assumed I must be like Margo, like mm -hmm. the main character. Um, sometimes in like obvious ways, but in other times, like in more subtle ways, and it's it perpetuate. It's still true now. Like as I as I put the book out, um, I hear people or like in reviews they'll refer to me a lot as a student, which was like theoretically true. It's not true now, but like you know, I'm also thirty seven. You know, like mm -hmm. my life, my life is not student. Margot's life is is as mm -hmm. a student. Um, I went for an interview once and like the reporter like slid in and she was like, so how long have you been single? I was like, I'm not single, <laughs> like, Margo is single. <laughs> um, and so that was weird. Um, so yeah, but I think, yeah, I mean, but also I think it's, it's up to me, Every almost everyone that I've met in person, like in right, readers especially, I actually think are better than we give them credit for. People get bad on the internet, mm -hmm. um, but one-on-one, -on -one, person to person, I haven't felt it as much as when I'm trying to like play a role kind of from afar. Mm -hmm. That's when it starts to feel very strange. Yeah. Um, so one of the wonderful things about Cat Person is that it is so grounded in reality, mm -hmm. which is funny because there are some of the tales in this book that have a very horror, supernatural almost bent to them. Yeah, definitely. And so I'm curious as to why use the framework of horror and some of the horror tropes to write about these issues that you write? Why are you intrigued by the horror that is done to others and that we do to others? Um, I mean, I don't know for sure. I was born that way, I guess. <laughs> um, I've always been a huge horror fan. That's the like the tradition that I feel like I came up with, that I was reading most passionately when I was a young, when I was a kid and a teenager. Um, so it formed my taste. I was like stealing Stephen King and Dean Koontz off my mom's bookshelf for you know um, as soon as I could. And so I think I think it's partly just that. It's just like you you love a particular like. Everybody, I think, in one way or another, is like born into a genre, and mm -hmm. like whether they like live, live in it or like you know embrace it or try to move out, like there there are certain stories that like just resonate most with you, and, mm -hmm. and horror was like that for me. Um, but I think also when I think about what horror did for me, when especially it was like 11, 12, 13, um, I think about how. I, I was so unhappy, <laughs> like in the way of teenage girls, mm -hmm. and how hungry I was for books and movies that would like let me ex feel that like heightened emotion, mm -hmm. and how at that time I didn't want to read stories about like other eleven year old girls having the kinds of problems that I was having. I wanted to read stories where like everyone on the planet died, because that's like how bad I felt, and it like it felt right, and that those high stakes of feelings I think is still kind of true for me now as an mm -hmm. adult, where like. I, if I write, it's very hard, and like, you know, you can do it eventually, but to write a story that can capture like how grueling kind of like day-to-day -day, like microaggressions and like life can be, it's like can often, like the, the, the emotions are so huge and, the, and the, often the incidents are so small. And I think Cat Person has a story about a small incident, mm -hmm. but I think one of the things that possibly the book as a whole does is like put it in this context of like much higher stakes sort of high melodrama mm -hmm. um, questions so that it gives a sense of like the subjective feeling of what it feels like to be alive in the world which is not only horrible mm -hmm. get, don't get me wrong <laughs> but like is a, is like a space that I feel like I, I work hard to express. Mm -hmm. Is that one of the reasons why um, some of multiple of your protagonists in this are also young and starting to navigate the big, bad, scary world. Um, do you find that it gives you the freedom to write with those heightened emotions because when you are young, everything is life or death? Yeah, it definitely. It might, it might be like that. It also might be sort of the, the reverse, um, mm -hmm. that that was a... Like, when I started putting the collection together, I was looking at themes and themes of girlhood and sex and gender and power. Like, all were kind of emerging out of the stories that I was selecting. And I feel like horror is, yeah, it's a particularly good way of writing about, um, like, life at that age. Because mm -hmm. there's so much about it that is inherently horrific. Like, puberty is horrific. Like, bodies are changing. Like, mm -hmm. everything is out of control. Um, and I feel like the book, like, moves in that space like back and forth. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
Do you also find that horror creates a safe space in which you can explore these darker, sometimes uh, shameful themes that society tells you, oh, we don't want to actually talk about that? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think fiction in general does, for sure. Um, I think letting... One of the things that I like from a story is if I have sure like say a shameful feeling mm -hmm. like a, an anger or jealousy or um like I, yeah just any any the urge to bite someone exactly <laughs> yeah like totally <laughs> for real um that impulse is like usually so quickly like squished down and that a story like doesn't just give you a chance to express it but like to pull it take it to ex an extreme to like mm -hmm. follow it to its natural conclusion to the point that it becomes horrific i think that can be a kind of like catharsis to read a story in that way and to follow a story through that um trajectory it's like it's not just like, oh, we've always been feeling this way and now we can talk about it. Like, I think the stories are, are more extreme than that. Mm -hmm. It's just like, okay, look, look, look as closely as you can, let it get really large, and then kind of let it go. Mm -hmm. One of the things that you do, and, and this is evident even in the title, is you kind of appropriate some of that language that we've seen in the Me Too era, um, you know you want this, and talking about power and control, how do you use language, not as a, a weapon, but, but as a tool to create um, the sense of familiarity within these stories? Huh. Yeah, I mean, I, well, the title specifically, I had, it was a line in one of the stories, and then while I was reading each story, as I put it in the collection, I realized it could fit in almost every single one, that there was a place where someone could have said that, and it would have fit, which made me feel like it was the right title, and that it was getting to a theme, which is about, like, specifically conflicted desire, and, like, people's desires being, like, negotiated or fought over, mm -hmm. um, and I think... I, like, but it's also like a very kind of like heightened title, right? Like I read somebody somewhere was like, it could be a Taylor Swift song. And I was like, yes, <laughs> like that. I like that vibe too. You know what I mean? Like the right. sort of exaggerated language of, mm -hmm. of this stuff. Not, I think is there maybe a little bit less than the mundane. You know, mm -hmm. the, the mundane um, has, a, has a place there mm -hmm. too. But um, yeah, I don't know. I, I like, I, I think there's overall in the, in the, I think the themes are very, I think they're serious, like I take them seriously, but I think a lot of the um, the language and the shape of the stories is like heightened, not just in terms of horror, but like in terms of like, um, not kitsch, but like, like, um, like 90s, like it's, it, there's mm -hmm. excess, there's an excess yeah. to the, to the stories and to the title that is, um, I don't know, that I feel like ties a lot of the stories together. Absolutely. And so how do you define your different characters' voices? Because what's great about the short stories is they're all very personal, but all the different characters have voices. Sometimes it's women telling the story. Sometimes it's a man telling the story. Sometimes it's two women telling the story about each other. Mm -hmm. How do you find those voices within the characters? Yeah. I mean, I think most of my characters, I don't... One thing I've never done is self-consciously been like, okay, I have to distinguish this character's voice from the other one. Like, what are the words they would use or what, you know, like, I've never done, or like, I've never built those, like, character sheets, you know, right. or I have, and now I don't do that anymore, where you, like, write what they eat for breakfast or whatever. Um, but I do think one of the things that a lot of my characters have in common, whether they're men or women, is that they're self-observers and they mm -hmm. spend a lot of time not just thinking, but thinking about why they're thinking what they're thinking and, and sort of observing it. And I think often it's out of that process that the characters like go in different directions and become sort of different people, you know, mm -hmm. because they, it's like a seed that like you plant and then it grows. And so like often the character will start for me with just like, one urge or one like action or a thing that they have to say mm -hmm. but then they're immediately thinking like why did I say that why did I think that and then they're sort of like growing out and expanding and why do you think so many of your characters share this compulsion for self-observation and not just once but obsessively not, I mean that truly none of the the book is not autobiographical as you can mm -hmm. tell from its contents um, and the fact that I'm still standing here <laughs> but um, I do think that's something that I have in common with my characters like that's a, a characteristic that I am I feel like that led me into writing and then I'm always interested in exploring and then I think 
in some ways I think it's like what to me makes these sometimes very ugly or difficult characters like for me it lets me connect with them I feel like I can always have empathy for a character who's like trying to figure out why they're doing what they're doing and not finding satisfactory answers mm -hmm. to me all of the moment there are a lot of moments in the book where people like, where the like narrator or the protagonist will sort of sit up and be like I don't how did I get here I don't know and uh and that, to me, I can always empathize with because, like, I've ended up in so many places that I didn't know how I got there, and I would never have chosen it. Um, and so that that feels right. Yeah. Now switching to a more autobiographical question, yeah. I was really intrigued by the dedication of the book, uh -huh. which is to your mother, who you say taught me to love what scares me. Yeah. Could you tell us a little bit more about that? Sure. I mean, my mom. I mentioned it a little bit, I guess, in the um, when we were talking before. My mom was a horror fan. Mm -hmm. She loved scary stories, she loves scary movies, so did like my aunts. Like I really do think part of it I just inherited. Mm -hmm. It's like weird dark bent. But um, also I don't know, I mean she was um, when I was growing up, my, my both my parents were like fairly controlling about what I was allowed to read and to watch. And my dad in particular had did not want me to like read or watch the like radar movies or horror novels. Mm -hmm. And she was like a little bit like off to the side so it was like funny and now it's funny in retrospect like how it became a real flashpoint for like what I was allowed to do and what I wasn't allowed to do and how much they could control me or not like in my adolescence when that's like the core question and so I think that's maybe another um the another answer to the question of like why I'm so drawn to horror is because like in the moment when I was trying to define who I was in opposition to my parents, um, I was choosing like the right to be terrified, <laughs> you know, the right to like do and read these things that are so like, like it's so easy to, to say like, this is terrible, these are wrong, you should like, what good are they? I was mm -hmm. like, no, they, they matter to me because I want to, you know, be here and read them and be a part, have them for myself. Another thing that really stuck out to me when I was reading some of the reviews for the book is that the Kirkus review talks about how the book really uh, encapsulates the vicious contradictions of being female. Yeah, that was a great phrase. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was wondering if you could expand on that, though. Um, what does that mean to you, these vicious contradictions of being female? <laughs> yeah, um, I think, well, there are a few. I, I mean, I think one of the things that I hope the book maybe traces out in its arc is that in the early stories in particular, um, female desire is always being negotiated in relationship to other to other people's desire, specifically in relationship to male desire. That um, there's very little sort of straightforward wanting and getting. Instead, it's like he wants this, but I want that. But I don't know. I can't have what I want unless he wants this. And so I'm gonna you know triangulate myself around these other desires and that that moving through that to um, desires towards the end of the book that like are maybe not that are dark and are not good like biting someone <laughs> um, but that nonetheless are like uncomplicated in the sense that the, the character knows from the beginning what she wants and what the obstacles are um, to getting that that to me speaks to something that I think is really true for not all women, but for a lot of them growing up, which is like recognizing how much open desire can be a trap. That the, the instant you like let yourself want something and you say like, that's what I want, this is the person, or this is the kind of person I want to be, or like express open desire, like the, like the forces will clamp down and you won't get it. Mm -hmm. And so you learn how to like just create yourself sort of in relation to what is actually possible and to what you might be able to get away with and to you know um and I, I think that kind of like cramped or kind of like confined desire um which has to do less like not even just with sex but just with like what kind of person you want to be or like how you want to be perceived in the world mm -hmm. um I think that to me is like has been core um, to being a woman growing up and like understanding that I was allowed to like want things uncompromisingly and like work to get them was a long and torturous process. Yeah. And so, uh, yeah, just one final question from me before we open it up to the audience. A lot of your stories focus around modern romance. And when I say modern romance, I'm talking about 
courtships that involve text messages, that involve carefully crafted emails back and forth, which honestly made me think of my own high school experience. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that thrill when I got an IM at like yeah. 10 o'clock at night, it felt so grown up. But um, it also explores the darkness of modern technology as it impacts romance and courtship and relationships. So my question to you is, is there a way to be successful and survive modern romance? Wow. I mean, that's a hard one. I yeah. can pass. <laughs> I mean, certainly. I think that there's nothing inherently impossible. <laughs> there's a high bar for yeah. you. Inherently impossible <laughs> about modern romance. I think it's the, the, the things we're talking about in terms of um, technology, online dating, text messaging, I think they only... Um, exacerbate a problem that has always been there, which is the problem that we opened mm -hmm. talking about, which is the question of imagining other people and how difficult it is to know other people and how much our own desires for how wanting to control them, wanting them to perceive us in a certain way, wanting them to want us, gets in the way of us knowing each other. And I think technology makes that worse or makes it harder because there is so much more space to, for invention around like a one word text message or like what does this emoji mean? Like you can tell yourself a whole novel about that in a way that I think for especially for like a certain kind of like imaginative and empathetic woman like can be a real <laughs> trap, you know? Um, but I don't think that there's any reason, like but I think that that has always been the problem and that I think overcoming it to me like I guess just as I have grown has been less about like getting better at like writing the novel or like interpreting the emoji and being more humble about like how little you actually can know about someone like in the first stages of getting to know them how much like other people just actually are unknowable to you and like becoming comfortable with that and like letting it be what it is as opposed to trying to like grasp it and understanding it mm -hmm. um, that to me is like for me, I don't know if I would say hope, but like that just seems yeah. like the truth, and like we, we can accommodate ourselves to it. Yeah. And we will survive. Sure, <laughs> probably, I don't know. Yeah. Great, cool. wonderful. I'd like to now open it up to audience questions. Yes. I just want to make a comment. Of sure. One of the things in, in reading and was um, your ability to write dialogue yeah. is amazing. Thank you. I mean, it, it, because it's one of those things that sometimes, you know, that's what not doesn't ring true. Mm -hmm. I know the story, the theme can all be really great, but if the dialogue doesn't carry that through, it's, I, I just think that's an amazing gift that you have. I know that you worked hard <laughs> get it, but um, it's also a gift. Thank you. Um, yeah, I worked hard on the dialogue. I, I work, one of the things that I was thinking about with cat person in particular and there's so much texting and stuff going on is that it's always a balance for me but like what can I convey realistically especially if I'm writing like a woman that's younger than me or if I'm writing a man it's like well I don't know how they would say this do I know how they would text it or do it like I know what they would be thinking you know and you're always trying to figure out like what's most accurate and also like what's within my own like capacity and so I think that good dialogue is like at least in one large part, knowing what you can't do and can't get away with, and like putting that stuff in summary, and then moving um, and working in, like within your strengths. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you. Anybody else? Anyone else? Okay, I can keep on asking you questions. <laughs> no, I mean, we can just yeah. Yeah. Um, so, how we we talked about dialogue. How do you get inspired to find? Um, find that cadence, that rhythm. Because that's the other thing for me that makes the dialogue ring true, is it never goes on for too long, or uh, it, it really is just as long as it needs to go. Uh, how do you, how do you, do you hear that in your head, or? Yeah, I, I would say dialogue, I usually write too much of it at the beginning. Mm -hmm. Like, I will write the full conversation, and then I'll go back, and I'll think about what I actually need to, like, convey. Um, there's, like, a kind of trope, I guess, or, like, a, a words of wisdom. Um, in MFA programs that I don't think is fully true, but that like any kind of dialogue should be doing at least like three things at once. Like you should be getting information, learning about a character and moving the story forward. Um, and I don't ever like go through and like with a pen and check that off. But I do think that like earlier, that's just like one of the things that like with practice came more fluently is knowing 
what you actually need to say and put in dialogue. Like, you don't need to have your characters introduce each other. Like, you could just be like, Joe met Kate or whatever. You know, yeah. they don't want to be like, hello, Joe. Because um, it's just a waste of time. And so, like, figuring out what you can cut, I think, is, is actually a, a big key to writing dialogue. Another theme that resonates throughout your story is this idea of responsibility. Mm -hmm. And do we take responsibility for our own actions or are we responsible for what happens to us? And I know for women in particular, especially with the Me Too movement, that is a charged question. Um, if someone does something to me, am I somehow responsible for that behavior? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a tough question. I mean. No, <laughs> you're not responsible for anyone else's behavior. And actually, I think that, like, spoken clearly is a theme of the book. Do you know what I mean? That we think we are in control of other people. We think we have the ability to manipulate them or, you know, move, you know, to, like, that we think often we have a lot of power that we don't. And that the confusion of power and responsibility, like, is really difficult sometimes to untangle. Um, but I think it's, it's real. Um, I think... Yeah, I think a lot of times that is true. And I'm trying to think of like if there's a story in particular that like is that illustrates that theme, that we take responsibility for things that are beyond our control because it's better than feeling powerless, you know? And so like, okay, well there's the mirror of the bucket and the old thigh yeah. bone is the like um the like fairy tale mm -hmm. in the collection. And um one of the I that story is about in a lot of things, but like in one thing, it's about like the weight of responsibility and feeling like your own desires are hurtful and not, um, and yet feeling unable to control them, but also feeling like they are hurtful and you have to take responsibility for them. And like sort of moving in that, like that is the thing of a, the theme of a fairy tale almost always is like the weight of the kingdom rests on this marriage decision and that sense of exaggerated responsibility um, for, things that are not necessarily in control of something that I'm always really interested in. Yeah, and, and to be clear, one of the great things that I love about the book is it's not always men who are doing, yeah. acting shamefully towards totally. women. Um, one of your stories, Scarred, mm -hmm. is about an abuse of power um, of a woman. Mm -hmm. And so, do you think that power of always corrupts? Or? <laughs> these are getting deep, these questions. <laughs> um, well, we've got yeah, there are. <laughs> Um, yeah, I think that um, it doesn't have to, but it, it's distorting. I think it's a distorting thing to have. And that, yeah, I mean, I guess that's a big part of the theme of the book is like lies about power that we tell ourselves. So that, that line that I was talking about, about responsibility, like what does, in Scarred, let's back up, in Scarred, it's about one, like, the, the things that you, the stories that you tell yourself to justify the harms that you're doing and how much justification goes into any kind of like willful um, exertion of power over someone else. And there's a line in that story that I feel like is really like kind of like was a self, not a self indictment, but like there's one, she's like worried about what she's doing. She's like torturing this man who may or not, may not be real. And she's like asking herself, you know, is this wrong, is this right? And then she like, but he, she's getting wishes granted. So she gets a wish granted, it's for intelligence. And she's like, I slept a lot better after that. Because I could think about, like I could tell myself a story that justified my action. I used my brain for that goal. And I feel like, it's so easy to be congratulatory when you finally come up with the answer that like exculpates you and lets you feel free of like responsibility for your actions and it's just like it's just another story so you are working on a novel can you tell us anything about that like it is a tease <laughs> no okay <laughs> i mean like, i can talk about it a little bit i can't really i can talk about the process of writing a novel okay um the i'm working on a novel i have written I've written drafts of novels before. Um, I wrote one six years, five or six years ago that like when I was first starting out that I got an agent for and it went out to editors and it didn't sell. And that was heartbreaking, but it um, taught me a lot. And so that experience was like reassuring that I could get a full length story out, which was great. And I think I feel confident in being able to do, but that it also taught me like kind of get to bring back to the beginning of like what's the difference between a novel right. and a short story 
that there are so many like satisfactions that um, novel readers demand that involve like a multiplicity of threads and like um, a sense of, of depth and sort of um, there have to be sort of like multiple multiple ways in I think I think as a short story I can often conceive of like I said as a single experience and a novel can't be like that a novel you have to be able to put it down and then pick it back up again and feel re like readily immersed in the world so I think it has to be fuller and it has to um, it just has to like take up more space and I've written a lot of like like I can write an 80 page essentially outline of a mm -hmm. novel and figuring out how to then like flesh that out and make it full while keeping the kind of propulsiveness that I think is that I really care about a lot in terms of like just the reader staying invested in what's going to happen. That's a real like technical challenge that I'm still figuring out. And to end on the writing process, what sort of advice would you give to anyone who aspires to put a story out into the world, whether it is their own or not? How do how do you um, how do you get your voice out there? Whoa! I mean. I think, so that's like saying that after you've written a story, then what do you do? <laughs> um, well, then you've done the hard part, so you congratulate yourself because you're, the hard work is done, and the part that you can control has largely finished. Um, and then, I mean, I, I think before Cat Person came out, I spent a good five years with my spreadsheet, you know what I mean? Like, where you write a story and then you send it to one magazine and that magazine rejects it and you put an X on the spreadsheet and then you send it out again and you just keep doing it over and over. And that was a great practice and that got a few stories into like tiniest magazines over the course of a very long time. But what it did was it taught me not to be precious about rejection, to recognize that like all I could do was roll the dice over and over and over in the hopes of it one day coming up in my favor, which it did. And I think that readiness to like let a story go, like when you put it out in the world, that's all you can do, right? You put it out in the world, you hope that someone picks it up, you hope that someone finds it. But like while that is happening or not, what you can do is write another story. And I feel like I'm really glad that I had that like um, sort of training ground of recognizing like how little control you have over everything, especially like now that like all this stuff happened around Cat Person. If I that had been the first story I'd written, the first story I sent out, I'd be like, wow, I really deserve that. Like I must have made that happen. And like I do feel in one way that I deserve it, but I also recognize the lack of all because I spent so many other times like rolling the dice and not, not having it happen. And so I think that that can be a really hard period as a as an aspiring writer, but it's really necessary and like people shouldn't feel obligated to skip it. It's it's good for you. And then I do have a final, final, okay. um, because you, you talked about letting go yeah. of, of your work. But since you also have this platform right now, what would you like us to know about this book and what it means to you? Oh, well, I mean, I, it's, it's a very personal book for all that it's filled with monsters and murders. Um, it, di it dipped into a real dark part of my psyche, and I had a lot of fun writing it at the same time. So I guess... I think that one thing I do is I really trust readers to know what they want, and I feel like the title is, like, right? Like, you may not want it, but you will know within the first five pages if you want it or not, so just read those first five and then decide for yourself, because I let it go into the world. So. Well, thank you so much for being here with us. Thank you, guys.